Daily Bible Time. Good morning. It is a Thursday morning. It's Dominic Steele here. Thanks for joining us. A little excursus today. We are up to chapter 6 in Isaiah. And uh, Barry Webb, the commentator, describes chapter 6 of Isaiah as a majestic peak in the surrounding terrain. It's clearly a central passage for the importance of the book of Isaiah. And uh, now I have had this book. I'll show it to you here on the screen. Uh, Christ and His People in the Book of Isaiah by David Peterson. I've had this book on my shelf for a couple of years ago since David well, he wrote it and gave me a copy actually he wrote it a few years earlier when he was principal of Oak Hill Bible College in London and it started out as a series of sermons that David gave to the Oak Hill College chapel demonstrating how to preach Christ from the book of Isaiah and that's what I'm trying to do I'm trying to understand how to preach Christ from the book of Isaiah how to preach Christ as Christian scripture and David's a man I've greatly respected since I first heard him speak on a church weekend away for the evening congregation that I was part of when I became a Christian in my 20s and later he was one of my lecturers and then we've become friends and worked together in ministry so I've been looking forward to working in detail through this book that David has written David starts with Isaiah 6 um but before I look at Isaiah 6 and see what David Peterson says, he has a very interesting chapter on preaching Christ from the Old Testament. And uh, I've spent a bit of time early this morning reading David Peterson's opening chapter, and I think I'll spend the next day or so reflecting on the principles that he outlines. He considers the work in his opening chapter of two other theologians. The first is a man, Sidney Gradanus, and Gradanus proposes a model um, that he's taken from Calvin and Luther. And... Um, mashed up from Calvin and Luther and we're going to follow Peterson's summary of Gradanus uh, where he suggests seven ways rather than one single method of working out the Christian significance of any particular Old Testament text and there's some overlap between the methods and they can be used in combination but um, the first one it's called the way of redemptive historical progression now that's a big title what it is it's the bedrock way that people understand Christ from the Old Testament. It means taking any and every passage in the broad context of the redemptive story, God's story of redeeming his people through Jesus Christ. Now, you know, redemptive history does culminate in Christ and in the ultimate rule of God over a restored and transformed creation. And so you take the particular chapter where the revelation is given and you consider how does this chapter relate to what has gone before as well as what will follow in God's plan. And so when I was taught this, I was taught to ask the particular Old Testament chapter four questions. One, what's the story so far? Two, what's the story about? Three, what does the story tell us about God and the way that he does things? And four, what does the story tell us about God and the way that he does things through Jesus? And so, look, if you've been part of Village Church for any length of time, often you'll hear me ask those four questions uh, of an Old Testament passage and actually uh, help people to see that that's the method that I'm using to understand this particular chapter of the Bible. Second one, the way of promise fulfillment. Gradanus notes that biblical prophecy is fulfilled progressively in installments. Uh, so interpreting the text, he says, it's important to move from the promise of the Old Testament to the fulfillment in Christ, back again to the Old Testament to determine more, uh, more clearly how the word is fulfilled, is being fulfilled and will be fulfilled. Thirdly, it's typology. This is where the New Testament writers discern an analogy between God's act in Christ and his redemptive act earlier in the Old Testament. Um, but Gradanus notes typology is more than just drawing analogy or parallels. It implies development, escalation, consummation, and sometimes contrast. There's a contrast. For example, in Romans 5, it says the first man, Adam, was like this. In contrast, Christ, the second man, is like this. Fourthly, it is just analogy. Old Testament writers frequently highlight the continuities in biblical history by casting later events and persons more or less in the image of earlier events and persons. The New Testament writers, they also do this. Uh, they apply to Jesus and the church passages, for example, that speak about God acting in relationship to his people Israel. And so that's a legitimate thing to do. Fifthly, just tracing a longitudinal theme there are there are different themes through the old testament you could take the theme of covenant or redemption or sacrifice or holiness and see how that theme is picked up in the new testament reinterpreted in the light of christ sixthly just seeing what the new testament does many new testament references where an old testament passage is quoted um 
they might um, uh, show promise fulfillment typology. Um, although sometimes they take an unexpected twist. Sometimes they'll use a method of interpretation. Think, oh, that's a bit strange. I wouldn't have thought that one is normative for today, but the Apostle Paul does it, so must be right. Um, <laughs> seventh, the way of contrast. Um, most of the earlier six methods focus on the continuity between the Old and New Testament. However, sometimes the New Testament sees a major difference in the way God is acting now to achieving his kingdom purposes and the way God did act in the past to achieve his kingdom purposes. And so it, it we, we just need to un- recognize that sometimes there will be a discontinuity. Now, they're the seven methods from Cradanus. Just tomorrow, we're going to focus on the Australian theologian, Graham Goldsworthy, and his approach. And Goldsworthy takes the redemptive historical approach that Gradanus does, but argues much more emphatically that all texts in the Bible point to Christ, bear a discernible relationship to Christ, and are primarily intended as a testimony to Christ. Um, and so, I mean, I'm just thinking of, um, and we'll do this tomorrow, but that line in 2 Peter 3, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness and to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So if all scripture, i.e. Old Testament scripture, is written to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, then when I teach Isaiah 6, I should be asking the question, how does this chapter make me wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? And I, I, I will look tomorrow at David Peterson's summary of Goldsworthy, uh, and then we'll look at Peterson's analysis of Goldsworthy and Gradanus, and I, I find myself very attracted to what Peterson and Goldsworthy are saying, and I'll look forward to sharing that with you tomorrow morning on Daily Bible Time. Thanks for being with us for this kind of background episode today. God bless. Thank you.